Thank you, Pastor Jeremy, worship team band. I am massively pumped up about closing out our series, How Big Is Your Butt? B-U-T. I've got big butts and I cannot lie. No brother or sister in Christ should deny. The purpose of this series is to look at some of God's people in this book who encountered some big butt God moments to help us shrink our butts. If you are a first timer, this is home. I love the church. I love the Big C, God's dysfunctional family of misfits, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to go and make disciples. Be one, make one. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, what about the hypocrites in the church, preacher? What about the hypocrites? There's always room for one more. So come on in as we travel back to one of the most memorable Bible stories on Mount Carmel between the prophet Elijah and the prophets of Baal. This Bible story seems like a scene straight out of a tribal war movie with taunting, trash-talking, and gruesome sacrifices that ends with, some of you know, God unleashing, come on, oh, aha, fire from heaven. Come on, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. If you have a Bible or the Bible app on your mobile device, grab it and go to 1 Kings chapter 16. 1 Kings is found in the OT, the Old Testament, next to his twin brother, 2 Kings. It's not really his twin brother. I just said that. It's around 975 A.D. Eric has just turned two years old. I'm just kidding. And the kingdom of Israel was split into two kingdoms. And during this time, an evil, sick, twisted king by the name of Ahab had come into power over the nation of Israel and God's people. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30 says, Ahab, watch this, did more things to disobey the Lord than any king before him. How would you like your story to be written for all of the world to know <laughs> that you did more things to disobey God than any other king before you? The King James Version says the king did evil in the sight of the Lord. The message translation calls him a new champion of evil because King Ahab seduced the people of Israel into worshiping false gods and false idols. Write this down, make a mental note. Satan is a master illusionist, and he has multiple disguises to tempt you to follow the ways of this world instead of Christ. But, but, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So stop letting Satan push you around and take your shield of faith and stand on the promise of Romans 16, 20 that says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Come on, Christ follower. In Christ, you, 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 you work from a place of victory. right? You, you, work, you are already victorious in Christ. You don't fight for victory. You fight from victory. Let's get back to our story. 1 Kings 17, 1 through 3. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. Elijah confronts King Ahab and says, Hey, bro, it's not going to rain until I say it's going to rain. Then God tells Elijah to hide because he knew King Ahab's personal mission was to stamp out every shred of faith in God's people. Look at verse 4. He said, you will drink from the brook, this is God, and I have ordered the ravens, I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. 
What a statement. What a concept. So he did what the Lord told him. Oh, it's quiet. Obedience. He went to the Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. This is off the charts. Amazing, church. Elijah experienced the first all-inclusive five-star resort that served crystal burgers and brook sunny water. Come on. Six packs are amazing, but have you tried a sack full of gut burgers? With cheese, they're amazing. Can you say indigestion? (laughs) They're good. They're so good. God said there's going to be a drought in the land, but I will take care of you. Which is a good deal because the entire land is starving to death. Verse 7, sometime later, the Bible says the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Now at first glance, this doesn't seem like a big deal. Just find another source of water or call your local Culligan man, which I was for 11 years and hanging out with John Fox. I had to get saved. I mean, it's like hanging out with a reprobate. And so if you have a broken Culligan unit, see John Fox, okay? This was the only water source according to the Bible. Sometimes God will lead you to a place of desperation to remind you that he is your source for living water. Verse 8 says, then the the word of the Lord came to Elijah. In other words, God let the brook dry up before he moved on his behalf. Newsflash, sometimes God leads us to a place of desperation because desperation leads to revelation. God is about to reveal himself to King Ahab and his worship of false gods of Baal. King Ahab is desperate. It hasn't rained in a long, long time, church. His cattle and crops are dying. King Ahab is so hacked off, he's hunting down every prophet of God and killing them until he finds Elijah. 1 Kings 18, verse 10. Let's continue with our story. It says, Obadiah, a servant of King Ahab, told Elijah, the king has searched every nation and kingdom on earth from end to end to find you. King Ahab wanted Elijah dead, not breathing in the ground dead. But God continued to protect Elijah until one day he walks into the king's palace. This is insane. Buckle up. It's about to get good. Watch this. When when he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, boy? I'm, I'm just throwing in, boy. You troubler of Israel? I, I have not made trouble of Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. You and your granddaddy and your daddy, your both greasy parents, grandparents, all of them. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and followed the Baals. Watch what he says. Now summons the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. That's 850. So Ahab sent word through all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long? How long will you waver between two opinions? If if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Elijah asked the people, how long will you waver between two big butt of opinions? Choose, make a decision, follow God or follow the ways of this world. There was no reason for Israel to be struggling with who God is. God had shown himself faithful over and over in supernatural and powerful ways. Yet God's people kept running back and putting their trust in false idols instead of God. Elijah, more or less, tells God's people, you have to decide. You have to choose who you will serve. 
But God's people said nothing because it looked as if God was outnumbered. God's people were so overwhelmed with fear, it left them in a state of divided allegiance. But Elijah was crystal clear that you have to choose between who you will follow, God, or this world. It's no different with us. It's no different with God's people. Jesus said in Revelation 3.14, and by the way, he's laying the smack down on God's people in the church of Laodicea. He said, these are the words of the amen. The faithful and true witness the ruler of God's creation. Hit the pause button. What is Jesus doing in this text? He's giving us his credentials. He said, I am the king of creation, the creator of all things, including you. I am the creator and you are the creation. Therefore, I have rights to everything that I have created, and that includes you. Verse 15, he said, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Jesus is dropping the hammer on his people. He said, I know your deeds, not your creeds, not your belief system. I see how you are living, and the truth is some of you are more concerned uh, what you know about me instead of how you are living. Belief system is not enough. The Bible says the devil and the demons believe and tremble. Information will never get you into heaven. Yes, salvation is a free gift, but the book of James says faith without works is dead. It's impossible to experience, to have a defining moment with Jesus and remain the same. It's biblically impossible. Jesus said, the way you are living is lukewarm, and I am about to spit you out of my mouth. What a visual, church. The way you are living makes me want to vomit. Now, some people use this verse to say Christians can lose their salvation, but that's not biblically true. It's not. The question is, did you authentically give your life to Christ? You can't lose your salvation. You did nothing to earn it. You can't do anything to lose it. But salvation is more than a prayer. It's more than raising our hand. It's more than walking down an aisle. It's more than getting baptized. Baptism is not salvation. It's an outward expression of an inward decision that I decided to follow Jesus and tell the world I'm not turning back. That's baptism. Jesus said in verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and what? Discipline. So be earnest and repent. Elijah asked, how long will you waver? Which means to hesitate, limp, or hop between two opinions. That's what God's people were doing. They were limping and hopping back and forth between worshiping God and the gods of Baal. Psalms 106 verse 19 and 20 says, The people, what people? God's people. Not the world. Not those who don't know God. The people, God's people, made a calf at Mount Sinai. They bowed before an image made of gold. They traded their glorious God for a statue of a grass-eating bull. Are you freaking kidding me? This trade is worse than the Red Sox trading future baseball god, small g, Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees. For a hundred thousand dollars and a loan, a loan to finance the no no Nanette musical. The Yankees won four World Series with Bay Ruth. Red Sox won zero. Right? It became the curse of the Bambino. Terrible, horrible trade. 
But it pales in comparison to God's people trading creator God for a God of their own creation. And it wasn't a lion, tiger, or bear, oh my. No, it was a baby calf. Things that make you go, hmm. There's nothing scary or awe-inspiring about a baby cow that plays with its own tail. (laughs) This seems illogical. But let's be real. Let's be honest. Let's put all of our chips on the table. Are we any different? Don't we trade God with statues of our own creation? An idol is when we value something or someone more than God. And here's the crazy thing about most idols. They rarely live in morally dark places. Some do, but it's usually a good thing that we made an ultimate thing. It's usually a gift from God that we have elevated over the giver of the gift. And that's what makes our idols so insidious. We move our worship from our creator to the creation. Idolatry starts out in our culture, but when it sneaks its way into our heart, it clogs our spiritual arteries with counterfeit gods. Things that we desire, like a nicer house, a newer and nicer vehicle. Can I give you a witness? That's me. For many years, I would lease my vehicles because I knew every two or three years, I got a new vehicle. Bigger TV. Guilty. I blame it on my eyesight. <laughs> no, babe. Uh, 75 just doesn't work. <laughs> Better paying job to be in shape. Ugh, right? For our kids to excel in academics or athletics because we don't want our legacy to be tarnished if they don't become a professional athlete or road scholar. All of us desire more money in the bank, true or false? It's true. And there is nothing wrong or wicked evil about any of those things. But an idol begins with a desire for more. It's like this $100 bill in my hand. God, I know that everything that I have comes from you. You are the source of every blessing in my life. But when an idol makes its way into our heart, our our hand begins to slowly close, and we say, this is mine. I earned it, and I want more. And all of a sudden, the money in the bank is non-negotiable. The new house is non-negotiable. The new vehicle is non-negotiable. Our kids' athletic and or college career is non-negotiable. So it supersedes making God and his house a priority on Sundays. And what you have is the birthing of an idol because you made a good thing an ultimate thing. God, I will tell, God, God, I will do whatever you tell me to do, but I'm not quitting this job. I'm not quitting this career. God, I will do whatever you tell me to do but I'm going to live in this neighborhood or I'm going to buy this vehicle even if I have to tithe or give less. God, I trust you with my salvation. I trust you with eternity. But God, this area is mine. Fill in the blank. The moment you say, but God, this area is mine, you have given birth to an idol in your heart. You're giving birth to an idol. When God said in the Old Testament, you shall have no other gods before me, do you think he meant it? Did he just say it to say it? I'm just going to put it out there. See what happens. When Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. Do you think he meant it? Of course he did. The moment we give our flesh authority instead of the Holy Spirit, people will become a stepping stone for our personal success. Our kids' lives will rule over everything, including God. John Calvin said the human heart, our mind, 
our will, our emotions, is a factory that is constantly creating new idols. It's why the Bible says we have to take every thought captive and do what? Make it obedient to Christ. Why? Because what controls our heart will control our lives. But all is good because we live in the Bible Belt where it's okay to go to church when it's convenient, sing a few songs, throw God a leftover bone. But it's all an illusion, a game of dress-up Christianity because the truth is you don't want to expose the very thing that you love more than God. Please understand my heart. This is not judgment or condemnation. I'm not pointing the finger of blame. I'm challenging you because I care. Our sin nature is wired to worship this world. The enemy constantly tempts us with the lust of the flesh, pleasure, the lust of the eyes, possessions, and the pride of life, power. God is not a killjoy. He doesn't care if we have stuff as long as our stuff doesn't have us. The question is, how do we live? Open-handed or close-handed? The world we live in wants you to worship the climbing ladder of success more than Christ. This world is passing away. The Bible says our lives are like the morning mist. It's here and then it's gone. Why would you give your life to this much of your eternity. Every accomplishment, admiration, and labor of this world will be useful after you die because it has no eternal value. King Solomon, who was the richest man on the planet, put it this way in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. He said, some people work wisely with knowledge and skill, then must leave the fruit of their efforts to someone who hasn't worked for it. This too is meaningless, a great tragedy. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Even at night, their minds cannot rest. It is all meaningless. Meaningless. Be honest. Who or what is first in your life? Who or what is getting your time? Thoughts, talent, treasures. Misplaced priorities will make us a pawn of Satan's lies and temptation. Is there a gap between your love for God and his demand for holiness? Is there a gap? Salvation is a beautiful thing, isn't it? But sanctification hurts. It hurts, church. God said, I have to be your primary focus and first priority before anything or anyone. God is a jealous God because he wants all of our adoration. He wants all of our dependence and reverence on him and him alone. In Isaiah 42, 18, he said, I am the Lord. This is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Isaiah 29, 13, the Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Lean in. Droughts in life are inevitable. It's going to happen. But in those seasons, you have to choose to either draw close to God as a cup of cold water on a hot, humid day or chase after idols to fulfill your life. You got two choices. Jesus said, blessed are those who what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Elijah said, how long will you waver? How long will you waver between two opinions? Whatever you do, stop playing in the middle. Isn't that that what we mostly do? We play in the middle? 
We try to have one foot in the world and one foot in Christian living. We try to take two paths instead of one. Let's land the plane. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 22, 17 verses. It says, Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Sometimes you have to stand up for what's right, even when you are standing alone. He said, let them choose one for themselves and and let them cut it up into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. He said, I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all of the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. O Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. He said, shout louder. Surely he is a God. Elijah has the gift of sarcasm right right? so do I my wife says it all the time perhaps he is deep thought or busy or traveling maybe he's on vacation maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened so they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed how insane the Bible says midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice, but there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. No matter how badly the prophets wanted their God, small g, to be real or their lifestyle to be okay, it wasn't. Newsflash, just because a lot of people believe something is right or true doesn't make it right or true. This book is truth whether you agree with it or not. Whatever this book says is sin is sin, even if everyone is doing it. That's right. Come on now. Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one from each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it the third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried out, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Many years ago, our kids used to sing the song, My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. God is big enough to help you overcome the big butt idol in your life. He's big enough. Walking in obedience is a daily battle for every believer. But the difference between short-lived or sustained obedience is simply our desire to contend for God's presence, power, and provision more than our profession, position, promotions, popularity, preeminence, or prosperity. 
the gravitational pull of this world is for you to leave your first love. Christians can't lose God's love, but we can leave it. We can abandon it. Jesus told God's people in the church of Ephesus to remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and return to your first love. Be honest. Has your worship become empty words? Has your devotion become duty? Has your love become labor? Are you more concerned about your physical appearance, possessions, prestige, or popularity than the idol that you are battling in your life? Is it a chore to be in church? The provision of repentance is dependent on the posture of our heart. Are you living your life your way or his way? Ask yourself these questions. Our worship team is going to lead us back into worship. And the front will be open for every believer to come and take communion. Communion is a time for us to remember what Christ did for us. The bread represents his body that was broken. And the juice represents his blood that was poured out to pay the penalty for all of our sins. I don't know what idol you are struggling with. But this I do know. Whatever area of your life is out of control, God is not in control. It's time for some of you to stop playing tug of war with your flesh and the spirit and give God full control because dividing your time between your idol and God is like living in a prison cell with no bars. It's insane. So as our worship team leads us, I want to challenge you, don't run up to the front and take communion and treat it like a ritual. I want you to grapple with these two verses. Psalms 139, 23. It says, search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. You see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. And then 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins. He is what? Faithful and just. And will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I want every person to stand to your feet. I'm going to pray. And then you'll see those verses. You'll see Psalms 139 and you'll see 1 John. It'll go back and forth. I want you to spend some time with God before you come to take communion. Say, God, I want to come to this table. I want to come to this place where I remember what you've done for me with clean hands and a clean heart. God, I have this idol in my life that is destroying me. It's wearing me out. I'm ready to repent. I'm ready to turn back towards you. Spend time with God before coming to this front. Make your seat a sanctuary. Make this front an altar. And then take communion. God, we love you. We worship you. God, I thank you for this series. It's been challenging, convicting for all of us for me and God I pray that that we God's people would leave here not feeling condemned or judged but challenged God to step into sanctification to know that you are calling us to a place of holiness yes we are made holy but we still have to live holy lives and it's your Holy Spirit that is inside of us that empowers us to do that So God, have your way. Move in a supernatural way. I pray that your Holy Spirit would shift the atmosphere in this room. And God, that idols would be defeated, destroyed. Your people would turn back to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.